Well, good morning, everybody. Happy Labor's Day. Labor's Day. What is that? <laughs> Anybody in labor? Go there. Uh, Labor Day, good to see all of you here. What a great crowd here in the Activity Center. I wanna say hey to the folks in our sanctuary and we live stream our 10 a.m. service. So we may have some folks that are traveling and tuning in online today. We're grateful for every single one of you. We are wrapping up a series that we've called Knock Off. And I want to take you to what for many of you will be a very familiar passage of scripture, and that is Matthew 28. So if you have a Bible, in just a few minutes, I'm gonna read this for you and teach this. And if you are new to all of this, uh, Bible included, we wanna help you to, to follow along. So we're gonna put the scriptures on the screen. We'd love to get you a Bible um, if we can today, or you can share with a neighbor or something. But we're gonna look at Matthew 28 and just just a few minutes. How many of you have heard, or maybe you've even seen Fool's Gold? You ever heard of that, Fool's Gold? Anybody? In fact, let me just put a picture of two rocks on the screen. One is gold, and the other is Fool's Gold, or pyrite. So just audience participation, both here in the sanctuary and online. If you think the gold is on the left, raise your hand, anybody? Okay, if you think the gold is on the right, Raise your hand, okay. All right, well, the gold is on the left. It's on the left. So, and in a picture like that, it's hard to tell. And there's been a number of people throughout history that thought they had struck gold when actually what they had was fool's gold, it's pyrite, it's not the real thing. And knockoffs are like that. That's what we've talked about in this series, that we can think we have something that is valuable, think we have something that will bring us all kinds of treasure in life, but it proves to be empty. So the knockoff is often the way of the world. And the genuine treasure is the life that God wants to give to us. So this has been a five-week series. And to recap some of the things we have talked about, we've talked about knockoffs and the real thing. So I'll show you a chart here. Uh, the knockoff we talked about was a life of worry. And the real thing is a life of worship. We talked about the knockoff being dangerous isolation. The real thing that God wants for us is this gospel-driven community or belonging, as we've emphasized it all month. The knockoff is coming into any place saying, hey, serve me, when the genuine thing is to come in and saying, how can I serve? The knockoff is this consuming greed. The real thing is this courageous generosity. And today we're talking about multiplication. The knockoff is for your life to be filled with multiple and multiplying distractions that aren't all bad, but things that take you away from God's great purpose for your life and mine as a believer in Jesus, and that is to be multiplying disciples. Today's message is called, You Are Made For More. You are made to multiply. That's how Jesus talks about believers. Believers are to multiply, churches are to multiply. That's how God designed us to be. He designed nature like that. Like for instance, here's a question. What is the fruit of an apple tree? Anybody know? Yeah, you think it's an apple. Trick question, that's actually wrong. At least it's not complete. The fruit of an apple tree is an apple tree. Apple trees were designed to replicate other apple trees. The fruit is merely a housing for the seed that is to give what the real multiplication is, which is another apple tree. And the same is true of believers. Now, when we talk about multiplying, specifically multiplying disciples, that's Christian language that we use around here. And we're talking about the Great Commission. My hunch is that most of you, not all of you, but most of you know what I'm talking about when I use the phrase, the Great Commission. There was a survey done a number of years ago by Barna in 2017, and it asked the average American churchgoer, have you ever heard of the Great Commission? 51% of people in that survey had never heard the phrase, the Great Commission. My hunch is because of the missional DNA of Johnson Ferry that, that your missional IQ is probably a little higher than other churches simply because we put such a huge emphasis on the Great Commission and sending people. And yet, here's the danger with today. It is easy to think, well, I know what that's all about, or I know how that applies to my life. 
And I'm gonna pray that as we read about the Great Commission and study that passage from Matthew 28 today, that we have a, a fresh heart that says, God, show me something. God, give me fresh ears, give me fresh eyes to see. So let's go to what is often called the Great Commission in Matthew 28, Jesus's last words after he had died on the cross and was making resurrection appearances. And these are the last words that are recorded in the Gospel of Matthew to the disciples. We're gonna start in verses 16 and read through 20. So if you got it in front of you, you stand up. I wanna read for you Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. Verse 16. But the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated to them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to follow all that I commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Father, we thank you for your word and we pray that as your word is read, as Lord, I attempt to teach your word, God, we understand that you are the great teacher. And we pray that your spirit would work in powerful ways as he convicts, as he encourages, as he equips us to be the people of God that you long for us to be. And Lord, my prayer today as we as we allude to the gospel and talk about the death, the burial, and resurrection of Christ. Lord, if there's anyone here today who does not know you as Savior and Lord, anyone today who is not born again, Lord, would today be the day of salvation? And God, may that be why they were here. Lord, we trust you to do what only you can do. We'll pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You can have a seat. We love to encourage people to take notes if that helps you to track with the message or maybe go back later in the week and review. So if that helps you, please do so. But let's look at this text that many of us have probably read before. Some of you may have memorized before and certainly you've heard it taught here. But let's assume that we're hearing it for the very first time. So what's going on in this text? This occurs somewhere in those 40 days when Jesus was making resurrection appearances. Sometimes we think that Jesus died on the cross, buried three days, rose from the grave and shoop, went up to heaven and that was it. Well, before that, shoop, there was 40 days. 40 days of him making appearances, 40 days of him teaching, 40 days of him proving that he was the resurrected Christ. In fact, 2 Corinthians tells us that at least 500 people had some kind of resurrection encounter with Jesus. And so in this moment, Jesus is interacting with his disciples. We're told that there were 11 disciples and they were told to go to Galilee to a mountain to wait for him, to look for him. And, and that should be our posture always, every day, but particularly as we gather for worship, that we're looking for Jesus, not that he's hiding from us, but that he is the focus of our attention and in our hearts. You know, sometimes we walk out of church and we talk about humans. Oh, he was great, or she was great, or they were great, or it was great to see that person. And that's normal and natural. But at the end of the day, we should walk out of this place feeling like we have met with God. And we have met with his Holy Spirit, so who are these 11? They're, they're the 11 disciples. They would be, of course, named apostles along with a few others in the New Testament. It says 11. If you know the Easter story, you know that Judas, one of the 12, betrayed Jesus, abandoned him in his darkest hour. And now there are 11. And Jesus tells them in verse 16 to go to Galilee. In fact, earlier in the same chapter, he mentioned that they were to meet him in Galilee. Why, why Galilee? Well, this was where Jesus did a lot of his ministry. This is where a lot of the, of the disciples were from. This is their hometown. 
Isaiah 9 makes reference to Galilee being Galilee of the Gentiles. So I think there's probably more going on here. This is also a gateway from the world of the Jewish people into the world of the Gentile people. I think that's strategic. And he says, go to the mountain. Notice the definite article there, the, the mountain. Now, we're not told what mountain this is in Galilee, but isn't it interesting how many of these pivotal moments in Jesus' life and his teaching happen on a mountain? Think about that. He taught the Sermon on the Mount. He took Peter and James and John and they saw him transfigured, a glimpse of his glory on the mountain. He, he taught the Olivet Discourse, which is his way of saying he taught about the, the things to come on a mountain. He gives the Great Commission here on a mountain. Zechariah says that he will come back with his feet on the Mount of Olives. So many pivotal things happening on a mountain. And, and we're told in verse 17 that when they saw him, these 11 disciples, this is so interesting, they worshiped him, but some were doubtful. What, what do you do with that? They, they worshiped him, but some were doubtful. I, I think this is normal human behavior. The, the word for, for doubtful is the word that means to hesitate. They were hesitating. I don't think that this means that they were denying that he was the Christ, denying that he rose from the grave. I, I think it would be like any of us, if, if the resurrected Christ stood in front of us and he's talking to us and, and interacting with us and it's, and it's him, but it's not exactly him the way we're used to seeing him and, and there's a glory about him that wasn't present in his earthly, all these things surrounding us, I think we would do the same thing. There's a sense that we would, that we would fall down and we would worship him, but we would also hesitate. Is this, what, what's going on here? And they worship and they doubt. And in this moment, Jesus gives these pivotal words. These are staggering words. Jesus says to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That is a staggering statement. All authority, not some authority, not just authority on the earth or just authority in heaven. No, no, all authority, all times and all places, both in heaven and on earth, he says, is given to me. He's declaring his sovereignty. He's declaring his power. Authority means weight, authority, influence, power. Daniel 7 prophesied that there would be a moment when the Son of Man would be handed over the kingdom under his power and his reign. And Jesus is saying, through the finished work on the cross and the resurrection, now I have all authority. Maybe you work in a job and you get frustrated at times because you have an influence, you don't have authority. There's things you wish were different at work. There, there's ways you wish people did things differently and you try your best through, through influence and peer-to-peer -peer relationships. But you know, when your boss says it, it's different. When he says it or when she says it, people do different things. Why? Because they not only have influence, they have authority. Jesus Christ is saying, all authority has been given to me. He's the boss and he has authority over everything. Do you know how staggering that is? That means there's not an ounce of your life in which Jesus does not have authority. There's not any part of this world or this galaxy or the heavens in which we are placed that, that Jesus does not have authority. He has authority over the winds and the waves. He has authority over all the animal kingdom, the whales and your little puppy dog. Jesus has authority over viruses and plagues. Jesus has authority over nations and presidential elections, amen? Jesus has authority over Satan, death, and the grave. This is a massive statement that all, all authority has been given to me. And the question is, what does he do with that authority? He commissions and he delegates that authority 
to his disciples in this moment. And he gives a command. He gives a command. In fact, if you study the original language, which is Greek, there, there's, there's all kinds of things that help you to know what's the main point of this passage. So I'm trying my best in English to relate that to you. And, and there's really one main command in this text with three different participles or ways to go about doing it. Not four commands, there's not three commands, there's not six commands, there's one main command, and then we're told how to do it. So you're asking, what's the command? Great question. The main command is this. I'll put it in the way it should be read. The main command is this. With all the authority he has on heaven and on earth, disciple the nations. Disciple the nations. That is the main command of this text. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. Now, we use that phrase a lot around here, disciple, or discipleship, or disciple making. A disciple, in its most basic term, means a learner, a follower. But to be a disciple implies more than simply being saved, though that is a massive thing. And as I prayed before I began to preach this message that if you are not saved, if you do not know Christ, if you've never repented of your sin and put your faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ so that your forgiveness is granted in his work on the cross and his righteousness is given to you and you experience the love of the Father, all these things that come in the gospel, that is a massive step to transfer from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. But in, in the great scale of God's work on the earth, that is not all there is. There's also the maturing and the growing and the becoming of being a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. And and he says to his 11 disciples, now this is amazing. He says, I want you to disciple the nations. Now what's amazing about that is that these 11 guys have never been more than 20, 25 miles from their house ever. Ever. I mean, you, you could go jump on a plane and you could be across the world in 24 hours. These guys have never been more than 20 miles from their house. And Jesus is looking at them and saying, I want you to disciple the nations. Now, now this is so important that we understand what he's saying here because I think it's often missed. And I gotta get a little technical with you. So I'm gonna take you back to your seventh grade English class, all right? I know for some of you that's a traumatic experience, but let me just try to take you back there. Do a little grammar here. We're gonna talk about transitive and intransitive verbs. All the English teachers just had a revival here in a second. So <laughs> this, this verb to disciple in the Greek is a transitive verb. You know, what's a transitive verb? A transitive verb is a verb that only makes sense if it has a direct object. So let, let's say that we use an example like a verb, go call. Go call. And your natural question is, go call, call what? Go call whom? Go call your mama. That's what I'm gonna say. Yeah, go call. See, it makes no sense unless it has that direct object. The same is true here. The verb make disciples makes no sense unless it's attached to a direct object. The direct object is the nations. Panta ta ethne, plural, nations. So this is all to be seen as one combined package. It's not just, hey, go make disciples, but it's literally go disciple the nations. This is a massive thing. Because if if we don't attach the discipling of all nations to the Great Commission, then we have missed the main point of the Great Commission. So I told you there there was one main command And then three participles or three ways that he says go about that one command of discipling the nations. What are they? Well, the first one is what we're talking about. It's going. Going. Or as you read in the English, go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. Going. 
Sometimes people read this text and say, well, it means, you know, as you go, which is kind of a casual way of thinking about it. As you go to work, as you're at your house, as you go to the gym, be making disciples. And I don't wanna say that's wrong, but, but it can lead to something that's wrong, which is an insufficient view of the Great Commission that only sees the Great Commission as doing discipleship in the places that are natural and convenient to you. I wanna tell you something, the Great Commission will never be natural or convenient to anybody. Which is what's so important about this commission. Jesus was not implying to his disciples that, hey, when I leave, I want you 11 guys to disciple one another. So Peter, you and John disciple one another for a little bit. And then, and then one of y'all needs to get with Thomas. He's always doubting about something. So somebody get with Thomas for a little bit. And then Thomas, you're gonna disciple Andrew for a little. No, no, no. The idea was you guys are gonna leave here. Somebody once said this, the go, G-O, stands for this, get out. You can't disciple nations if you don't get out, get out of your comfort, get out of your routines, get out of your hometown. The Great Commission will never be comfortable or convenient. And think about this. Jesus would never send you to disciple the nations if he didn't also already have authority over all the nations. Because he has authority over all nations, whether they name the name of Jesus or not, he can send you. That needs to be our attitude, God send me. And yes, it's not always across the world. Sometimes it is across the street. But do we have a heart that's seeking to go? One of the most basic things we encourage people to do here at John's Ferry is to simply to care through prayer. I know a lot of you are intimidated to go share the gospel, let alone go across the world. I, I get it. But just, just start by praying for people. Prayer walking, certainly, but even just praying prayers for people. Certainly when people have a need, pray for them. Sometimes you just go up to strangers and ask you can pray for them. We do that from time to time. Maybe it's, it's a waiter or a waitress at a restaurant. You're not trying to be weird about it. You say, hey, look, we're gonna pray for a meal. This may sound crazy. I just, I'd love to know if there's anything we can pray for you about today. You'd be amazed at many gospel conversations, just praying. But it, it starts with this attitude that I want to go. If I'm gonna disciple the nations, I have to go. I have to get out. What's the second thing? Not only going, but number two, baptizing. Now, baptizing is this, this mark of public identification with Christ, and it is a central part of making disciples. Now, we're Baptists, so we're kind of into baptism. But I should say this, baptism doesn't, doesn't make you a Christian. There's nothing in the water that makes you saved. The thief on the cross, remember him in the Easter story? He was never baptized, he went to heaven. So you don't have to be baptized to be a believer. But as you read the New Testament, you see the order is the same. Someone repents of their sin, puts their faith and trust in Jesus, and the very first act of obedience is baptism. Sometimes I hear people say, you know, I need to get baptized, but I've gotta work on a few things first. I gotta clean some stuff up in my life, and then I'll get baptized. And I would tell you, friend, you don't have a clue what baptism's about if that's your approach. The whole point of baptism is death to self. It's admitting I can't clean myself up. I need the power of Jesus to clean me up. And so I'm being baptized. It's this public identification that I have died to my old self and I've risen to have a new life in Christ. It's a little bit like, like a wedding ring. I would take this off, but I have fat fingers. So <laughs> let me ask you a question. Does this ring make me married? I mean, if I, if I took it off, let's just say I could get it off. If I took it off, would I still be married? Of course, the, the ring doesn't make me married, but it is a visible symbol that my heart is taken. And I'm loyal to my wife, Terica. Baptism is a visible demonstration that my heart is taken, not only with Christ, but with the triune God. Notice he says that we are baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, it's never wrong to emphasize Christ, and we need to emphasize Jesus Christ, but sometimes we emphasize Christ in a way that diminishes the also awesome role 
that the Father and the Holy Spirit play. In baptism, we are united to the Father who purposed our salvation before the foundation of the earth. In baptism, we are united to the Son who accomplished our salvation in the fullness of time. In baptism, we are united to the Holy Spirit who daily applies the good news of the gospel of our salvation to us. In this act of baptism, we are identifying with a triune God who invites us to be united to him. So we go and we baptize. And then the third participle is that we are teaching to obey. Teaching to obey. That we are called to share the gospel. Sometimes, you know, we, we, use, we use language around here uh, that we exist to help people find truth, belonging, and purpose in Jesus. And those are really words to get at the power of the gospel, that in Christ, we do find truth. In Christ, we do find this belonging, this community. In Christ, we do find purpose. But we're not content with someone merely crossing the line of faith and and becoming a a born-again believer. That's awesome. That's great. But we want you to grow from there. We want you to mature from there. We, We want you to become the person God wants you to be. I love what some person said one time. They said, God... God loves you so much that he will accept you as you are, but he loves you too much to leave you there. And and that's the part of teaching to obey, that we're helping people come around the teachings of Jesus, applying them into their life, and not merely being content with being born again, but also growing in the things of Jesus. It'd be like this, like imagine that you're, you're having a baby and you know, for nine months, it's a big deal and you're celebrating it and you're taking pictures and you're celebrating, you have parties, all this kind of stuff and a big buildup, right? And then you go have a baby, which obviously is a, is a hard thing, I hear, you know, uh, to have a baby. But just imagine if you went all of this, you had all this fanfare to have the baby, you got to the hospital, you have the baby and then you leave the baby to the hospital, you come home and go, that was awesome. We should do that again sometime. <laughs> no, no, no. They make you take that baby home. <laughs> and then the real work begins. And the same is true in discipleship. It's awesome to see someone born again, but now they have to grow and they need help to do so. Now at Johnson Ferry, we are trying our best to find ways to help people grow in the things of the Lord. And there are lots of different ways that we try to do that. One of the things that we have emphasized a lot is something called 419 groups. And I, and I understand that sometimes we'll throw out that comment, hey, join a 419 group, but we never really take time to say, this is what it is. Well, what is a 419 group? A 419 group is, is a disciple-making group and its intent is, is really one thing. What is it? It is to turn disciples into disciple-makers. If it's done right, at the end of being in a 419 group, you are then equipped to begin a new 419 group. And a 419 group is based off of Matthew 419. Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. It is this accountable, usually small group, usually three to six people, typically gender exclusive, guys with guys, girls with girls, helping one another pursue the things of Jesus so that disciples become disciple makers. And that's the number one way that we're helping to multiply disciple makers. If you wanna learn more about that, how to begin one, go to johnsonferry.org slash 419. There are videos on there, lots of information. All you need to start a 419 group are three things. You need the spirit of God, the word of God, and the people of God. And we can help you do it. We want you to be a disciple. Now, early in 2024, if you were here at the beginning of this year, we talked a lot about being a disciple in a series that we call Things That Stick. And and we gave you a definition. I think it's good for me to remind you of that definition. What's a disciple? A disciple is one who has found Jesus, is following the ways of Jesus, and is leading others to do the same. That last part is often the forgotten part. We, we love the idea that I found Christ or maybe more specifically, he's found me. I'm now following in the ways of Jesus. But the goal of being a disciple is that one day you become a disciple maker. Remember, apple trees are meant to produce other apple trees. So Jesus says, disciple the nations, going, baptizing, teaching. And I love this. 
overwhelmingly comforting phrase in verse 20. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Because you're, you're like me, you're going, I, I can't decide. I barely know the Bible. I, I've never even been across the world. I don't, I don't know all these people. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't, all these doubts and fears. And Jesus reminds you two things. One, I have all authority, not you. And two, guess what? I'll be with you. It's like he's pushing little birds out of the nest. He's helping these little plants to grow, giving them comfort. One time Jesus said this to his disciples. Now this is a staggering statement. He said, it is to your advantage that I go away. And you're like, Jesus, in what world would it ever be to my advantage that you go away? He says, it is to your advantage that I go away. This is what he said in John 16. Why? Because when I go, the helper will come. Who's the helper? The helper is the Holy Spirit. And he will come and indwell you and empower you and equip you and lead you and convict you and guide you. And Jesus is gonna multiply himself through his spirit in his people such that you can go and do everything that Jesus wants you to do. If you freak out at the idea of living on mission, guess what, you are normal. But be reminded today that he has all authority and he promises to be with you to the end of the age. So we are to disciple the nations. If you think I'm talking about some special Christian, I'm talking about you. You, if you're a follower of Jesus, you are the one God is calling to disciple the nations. Now the heartbeat of this series is that we are living in the ways of God, in the ways of a disciple. In fact, Though we titled this series Knockoff, this whole series is really building the five ways of Jesus. You remember the five ways? We talked about them earlier in the year. In fact, here's a picture. Five ways of a disciple of Jesus. Multiplication, worship, community, service, generosity. And I, I love it's not like we're checking boxes. Okay, good, I got worship down. Then I gotta move to generosity, check that box. No, it's like a tree trunk where it's growing and growing and growing and getting bigger over time. I never, I never, get to the point where I've got it down perfectly, but I'm growing in my worship of the Lord. I'm growing in my generosity. I'm growing in the ways I'm serving. I'm growing and learning to multiply. I'm growing in community like a tree expanding. And this whole series has really just been a series on the five ways of Jesus. That's like the big reveal at the end of the series. Because that's all we've talked about. What have we talked about in the series? We talked about community, service, generosity, worship, and today, multiplication. And God wants us to multiply. So what do we do? Let me offer three next steps to you today as we wrap up this series. And I hope this has been helpful for you. I'll go through these fairly quickly. Number one, you're gonna disciple the nations, well, you need to be around people who don't know Jesus. I wanna say something super profound, you ready? You can't reach people far from God if you don't know people far from God. <laughs> but how many of us spend all of our time in our little holy huddles with people who think just like us, believe just like us. Now, now, there's a beauty in that. Believe me, there's a beauty in that. But sometimes we get closed off from a world that desperately needs to hear the gospel. And if you wanna have a heart for the world, here's something simple, number two, prayer walk your neighborhood. That'd be something you could do this week. Begin to prayer walk your street, your neighborhood, your apartment complex. Do you know all the people living on your street? Do you know their names? More importantly, do you know if they're followers of Jesus or not? Start to pray. You know, we, we often encourage this Bob prayer. Burden, opportunity, boldness. Burden, opportunity, boldness. Burden, God, give me a burden for, give me a burden for my street, Lord. Because I don't. So just give, Lord, give me a burden. And God, give me opportunities. Like put, put supernatural opportunities in front of me that, that I just happen to meet my neighbor when we're taking the garbage can out. And Lord, when, when those opportunities turn from talking about the weather and football and complaining about our HOA and all the things we do, 
Give me the boldness to speak the gospel, to pray for people. All right, number three. I wanna encourage you to start an off-campus 419 group that meets in your home or meets in a coffee shop, meets at work, your gym. We want you to be disciple makers, not just disciples, but disciple makers. It's such a great way to do it. This, this is what God is calling us to do. This is, this is the work that we are to be about until he comes again. And this is the burden that we need to have, a burden for the Great Commission. That, that's the thing that we need to think about. I, 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 never, I never get complaint letters about the Great Commission. I get my other stuff, amen? <laughs> oh, Clay, the music, or oh, why don't we talk more about the election or less about the election, or Clay, you talk too much about football, or you talk too less about football, or Clay, you, oh, I get letters about all that junk all the time. You know what I never get a letter about? I never get a letter of anyone going, hey, why are we sharing the gospel more? Hey, why are we, why are we being more disciple maker? I never get a letter like that. And yet that is the thing that we should be burdened about. Why? Because he has all authority in heaven and on earth. And he will be with us to the end of the age. And that's good news. I want us to end today by being reminded of these powerful words. And so in, in both venues, I'm gonna ask you to do something almost like a responsive reading. Would you just stand up, both, both venues here in the sanctuary? And I'm gonna put these words on the screen Math, for Matthew 28, the Great Commission. And let's say these as a, a declaration of what it is that Christ wants us to do and what we're gonna be about this week. We're gonna start with the all authority. Let's all say it together. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to follow all that I commanded you and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Father, that is our hope, that is our prayer, that because all authority has been granted to you, we can go in your name and make disciples of all the nations, knowing this great promise that you will be with us to the end of the age. It's in Jesus' name that we say that, we pray that, and we sing it. Amen and amen.